I have insurance and so I don't need to focus on anything else other than just my physical well-being because a bike is completely replaceable and the fact that you have insurance and that you're protected and you're covered all you need to do is focus on yourself and getting yourself better like I'm gonna try and I'm gonna take risks and I'm gonna take chances because why else why would you not right I'm Alicia Speak I'm 37 I'm a full-time lawyer but I'm also a cyclist for Cycle Team London <laughs> oh wow! Well, here we are. Uh, we did, we've been at the Ruler Classic before, haven't we? Uh, we have. I think we were here the first year when it was the Ruler Semi Classic. Um, it's obviously grown year on year, and who could have who could have predicted that one day we'd have Greg LeMond and Phil Anderson as our warm-up acts? Incredible! <laughs> yeah, I mean it is astonishing, really. Um, I I stood in for a bit of Greg LeMond, and that uh, was fascinating. Francois. Well, it was fascinating. I mean, some of the stories were, were very familiar, Richard. I don't know. Somebody <laughs> should write a book about the 86 tour. <laughs> they should, really. Um, Francois, you, you caught up with Greg Lamont backstage because you've got I, a story you keep telling us about, and now we actually know it's true. Yeah, I would, well, that's right. Most of my stories are, are well, of course, I invented fake news long ago. But, uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was very, I mean, just... just in the lobby behind you there, uh, I, I was re reunited with Greg LeMond for the first time in like 30 years, you know. And the last, well, not the last time, but one of the last times I really talked to him at length was in, on the 1989 tour. Uh, well, you know, you all know what happened in the 1989 tour. And the, the last real long talk I chatted with Greg LeMond before the one I just had now was in the TGV coming to Paris from the, the penultimate stage. And nobody wanted to sit next to the loser of the tour, to Greg LeMond. So there was, there was Greg there sitting on the, on the train, an available seat next to him. So I, I did sit next to uh, Greg LeMond. And for all the way from, I think it was Dijon, up, all, all the way up to, uh, uh, to Paris, we, we chatted. He, he told me all about his life, the hunting accident, we're coming back to cycling, and how exciting the tour had been and everything. Uh, of course, I didn't take any notes. I didn't record the... Uh, not the interview, it was a friendly chat. And the uh, next day, obviously, on the Champs-Élysées, Greg Lemond wins the Tour de France by eight seconds. And I have nothing. I mean, no, not <laughs> a quote, not a, not a re recording, not, no notes. I had uh, everything ready, written about Laurent Fignon winning the Tour, you know? And uh, so, well, I told him, you bastard, you know? You <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we simply recorded you, you, your you, conversation you, just now, so yeah. it's fine. <laughs> And Phil Anderson, I, I encountered Phil Anderson in a criterium in Dundee in 1989, possibly when the Kellogg's Tour of Britain started there. And he was there, taking, he did a criterium, and I went along with my cycling top, and I got him to sign my top. My mum then embroidered it, the signature in. Um, and, you know, that, a hero to me then, uh, a very exotic, very glamorous figure, but... To be honest, anybody with a suntan was quite exotic in Dundee, <laughs> and he certainly had a good suntan. What did you do with the jersey? Because you could get a few quid for that on eBay now. Yeah, no, that's a good, good shout line. Have you still got it? I probably do somewhere, yeah, yeah, yeah. Bring it on our theatre, tour of the theatres around the UK and Ireland uh, later this month. I will, But no, a great honour to be following in their, in their wheel marks, footsteps tonight uh, at this wonderful event, uh, the Ruler Classic. Do, do they have an equivalent of this in France? Francois. Oddly enough... Uh, What's French for ruler? <laughs> <laughs> and, and what's French for classique? I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, no, I mean, oddly enough, and that's a good thing for me, and that's why I'm so glad, you know, that you guys picked me up one day at random in the press room to, to be the Frenchman, you know, to sometimes join you guys on the cycling podcast, because uh, uh, as, as much as cycling is, is highly popular, it's, it, it's ingrained in our... Uh, uh, DNA, you know, uh, th th there aren't that many events around cycling, uh, you know, as popular as this or all the shows we do with the podcast. I mean, if we, I'm pretty convinced, that I'm, I'm, I'm right in saying so. If, if we had, if, if, if we had a show in France with the uh, uh, Bernard Hinault, uh, Jean-François Bernard, whoever, you know, great stars, even Warren Barguil, Thibaut Pinot, and, and in a theatre, and uh, and you know, with lots of advertising and the radios and everything, you, you probably. 20 or 30 guys would, would you know, turn up. Uh, it's, I don't know, it's not in cycling seen by the, the French is, you know, you, you, you get to roadside, you, you see the, the guys, uh, you know, 
drives. We, we, we don't talk about cycling that much. I mean, it's, it's kind of a culture. Uh, it's, it's very different. It, it's, that's why it's very surprising for me that I, I'm able to kind of be paid or at least, you know, or, or that you guys are coming here to, to listen to me talk about cycling because it, it, it doesn't happen in France at all. Raymond Poulidor <laughs> brought out a, a latest verse of his autobiography a couple of years ago and I noticed in my, in my uh, wife's family's village that he was doing an appearance at the local library and he was doing a, a tour of libraries in, in France and that's Raymond Poulidor, you know, one of the, one of the great stars. Um, but one of the, the revelations of this year's tour for me was, again, language related, learning that the French don't use the word echelon. What was the other word? What was the other word? There was another word that we use in, in talking about cycling. Domestique, of course. Oh, yeah, Sorry, domestic, thank you of course, for that. Domestique. domestique and echelon are not words that you used in talking about cycling. Never. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, that, that's right. I mean, he, uh, it, it was kind of surprising for me when I started wor working in English on, on uh, cycling and uh, when I was working for Reuters uh, in the old days, that these words were, would appear, that, you know, look French, sound French, uh, are French. I mean, echelon means something. It's a little scale, you know, uh, in French. So uh, if you go up an echelon, it means you've gone up one uh, step or something, but it, it's never, it's, it's never bordure. We call it echelon bordure. That's the word in French. And, uh, and domestique is, is a word we use, well, not, not very often because there aren't many domestiques these days. I mean, it means a servant, you know. In the old days, families had domestique, you know, guys working for them. Uh, in, in, fr in French, we never use the, it. We, we use the word uh, équipier, which means teammate. And, uh, and domestique is strictly uh, British, so English. I mean, it's pretty strange. What do you call the Tour de France? Well, well, we, we call it the Tour de France, which is not exactly the same. <laughs> Excellent. Well, this is all great. This is all great. But we we are here to unveil the cycling podcast, Ruler Classic Grand Tour, um, Hall of Fame, alternative Hall of Fame um, inductee for 2019. Uh, so we probably better get on with that because we, we're up against it time-wise. We are. Um, th we've each got a nomination and we'll, we'll explain why uh, we think this person should be this year's Grand Tour um, Alternative Hall of Fame. We don't want to steal the thunder of the Ruler Classics Hall of Fame, which has got some truly deserving winners in it. Uh, not to say that, the, that our winners won't be truly deserving, of course. Um, I've got an envelope here, totally pointless, really, because I know um, who's, who I've written down, but I've just uh, made it, you know. <laughs> and, uh, well, you know, you, you, you need an envelope. It's a nice for, propped. You do. Now, you may be under the impression that this year's Giro d'Italia was won by Richard Carapaz, becoming the first Ecuadorian rider to win a Grand Tour. But you'd be mistaken, because actually, the true winner of the Giro was Max Chiandri, the self-styled ninth man of the Movistar team. Um, Max joined Movistar as a sports director at the start of the year after eight years with BMC Racing. Um, he has Italian parents, but he was born in Derby, which makes him Anglo-Italian. This so is Wikipedia entry you're reading. <laughs> <It's> Wikipedia, <laughs> which, which I wrote earlier today. <laughs> um, he's an Italian as a Pizza Express chicken pizza. That's a reference for <laughs> our, uh, our friend Daniel Freib, who, who polices these kind of things. But he's as English as a pint of Peroni drunk in a Weatherspoons. And that makes him as Anglo-Italian as an afternoon mochaccino topped with whipped cream. <laughs> Lovely, isn't it? <laughs> Sounds nice. Sounds nice. Um, Max Chiandri won a bronze medal in the road race at the Atlanta, Olymp uh, Atlanta Olympics in 1996, which was before cycling was even invented in Britain. Can you imagine that? <laughs> he kick-started a revolution, you could say. And when it comes to naming the Derby Velodrome after one of the greats of British cycling, it's surely got to be a choice between Max Chiandri or Dave Browsford. And I know I'll be voting for the Max Chiandri Ninth Man Velodrome, and I'd urge you all to do the same. <laughs> He rode for Motorola when Lance Armstrong was there. He rode for Francis de Jure when Davide Rebelin was just a 28-year-old rider <laughs> as opposed to a 48-year-old rider as he is now. He also rode for the Linda McCartney team, famously sponsored by the vegetarian food manufacturers. Now, that, the deal with that team was that no one could eat meat either at races or in any kind of... Uh, you know, official engagement. And Max took this very seriously, so much so that at the tour down under, when he was mistakenly photographed eating a kangaroo kebab, he asked the photographer Graham Watson to delete all the photos off his camera. Now, at the start of the year, 
he joined Movistar from BMC Racing, and it never seemed that much of a good fit for him at I'm BMC. I'm amazed you're not telling your Matt Chandry, um, uh, Linda McCartney food story uh, involving his dog. <laughs> there isn't time. I've had All to right, cut sorry. That out. Okay. <laughs> Basically, right. Max Chandry got a whole consignment of uh, Linda McCartney foods delivered to his house in Italy: um, <laughs> lasagnas and chicken, not chicken nuggets, and, and not beef lasagna, and so on and so forth. And after a few days, uh, you know, he'd he'd eaten enough of this stuff. And then he gave a load to some teammates, and then he gave a load to some riders on other teams. And uh, in the end, he gave some to his dog, <laughs> who, uh, who, who walked up to the bowl and, and just sort of turned away and, and walked back out into the garden. <laughs> anyway, Max and Movistar is the perfect match because Movistar, there are no spreadsheets, there's no Google Hangouts, there's no team meetings, there's no training camps, there's no tactics. <laughs> <laughs> there's no leaders. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. At the first team talk at the start of the year in Spain, Max is... Um, briefing to the riders on the bus was, vamos chicos, let's go guys. <laughs> but the Giro itself was a strange race. Um, you could say it was the pasta pot that never reached a boil, uh, making it the al dente Giro. Now I know that doesn't really work because pasta is supposed to be eaten al dente. So maybe it's the spaghetti hoops on toast Giro, <laughs> I don't know. But I remember the stage early in the race to Orbitello, stage three, the big story of the day was Elia Viviani who had won the stage in the Italian national champion's jersey and then was stripped of victory um, because he basically um, sprinted in an irregular fashion. And we kind of missed the story, Daniel and I, there because Richard Calapaz had had a mechanical problem um, with nine kilometres to go and lost 46 seconds. And we didn't really talk about it that much. It was kind of a note in passing. And it just struck me when I look back at the Grand Tour season how many how many times the races are made up of these incidents that you don't appreciate the significance of at the actual time. The following day, Carapaz won at Frascati. He surprised everybody. He held off Caleb Ewan in the sprint, who I later called Cadell Ewan when I uh, spoke to him at the team bus. And I wondered whether or not his move that day was a direct result of um, the, the time loss he'd had the day before. And, and you can never really know the answer to those questions. But what we did know two weeks into the race was that he was the strongest rider in the mountains. He was just never faltering whenever um, there were moves on GC. And so I went to speak to Max about Calapaz to try and find out a bit about what sort of character he was. And, and Max was, uh, um, you know, basically said he's very, very quiet, very modest. He said in one of the rainy stages early in the race, a little voice came across the radio, Tengo frío, por favor. Basically, he was cold and he wanted his jacket. And Max said, at the team he'd previously been at, it would have been, bring me my jacket now. Whereas, you know, Calapaz was uh, a, a sort of gentler soul. And I wasn't really taking him seriously as a potential winner of the race, partly because of that. And particularly because we've been so critical of Movistar's tactics over the years, haven't we? Um, I asked Max what the difference was in this team because they were all lined up behind Calapaz and they all seemed to have a, a, a singular goal. And he said with uh, self-effacing, uh, typical self-effacing nature, I wouldn't say it's down to me, but the riders raised a toast the other night and said, here's to the new director, <laughs> implying that it was all down to him. <laughs> now, my last day on the Giro, we started in Ivrea, the stage finished in Como, and I was just going around the buses and Richard and I kind of met up at the Team Ineos bus and Dave Browsford just kind of came over, ghosted over and just said out of nothing, out of nowhere, unprompted, hey, you know we've signed Carapaz for next season, don't you? This was the morning after Carapaz had taken the pink jersey, and it struck me as odd that Brailswood would kind of tell us this. Clearly, he wanted us to get this news out into the public domain, but we were, we'd been burned by this before. Richard famously once reported that Geraint Thomas was going to join BMC. Um, I mean, Geraint Thomas is still racing. BMC doesn't exist anymore, but, um, you know, it was still, still impeccable sources, Rich. Um, <laughs> But um, we wondered, you know, are we being played here? Does Brailsford want this in the public domain? And so we mulled this over for a few days. And Richard, in the end, you decided to tip off Chiro. At no, 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 that's Della not Sport. what happened. No? No, no, I think Brailsford tipped off Chiro as well. Ah. Um, and probably said the, the same thing, you know, Psst, keep this to yourself, lads. But, um, and it, it was definitely something he wanted to get out there because Movistar didn't know. Movistar no. didn't know that Carapaz had agreed to join any of us. Well, no, that's it. It struck me that only Movistar could lose a rider while he was in the process of winning a grand tour for them. <laughs> but 
that is why Max Chiandri is my nominee um, for this year's uh, Hall of Fame inductee, only the second British uh, sports director to win a Grand Tour. Well, my, uh, just before we pass on to Francois, we better rattle on here, actually. You took a lot of time there, Lionel. But <laughs> my, my, briefly, my favourite favorite Max Chiandri story, he was, he was uh, running the British Cycling Academy in Tuscany after Rod Ellingworth. And in 2010, I went to visit them there, and he gave me a tour of the house, and uh, he was telling me about how everything was organised and planned and all the rest of it. And he took me to the, the wall chart on, above the desk, and he, we were looking at that. He said, yeah, you see there, we've got you know, all the guys, they have their, their races planned. And, and we stared at it and kind of in silence for a few moments. And then he said, yeah, actually, that's last year's wall planner. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if you're wondering why there's this kind of gap in the conveyor belt, why it kind of slowed down for a bit, and there's basically nobody between Gary Thomas and the Yates brothers. I think Max Chiandri is possibly <laughs> the reason. Um, Francois, have you got a nominee for a Hall of Fame? I've got three nominees. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I've got a man, a woman, and a, and a cat. <laughs> okay, we've got 10 minutes left, so. Uh, okay, no, I'll, I'll be, I'll be the, the, the man for me, my, my alternate nominee uh, for the, the Grand Tour Hall of Fame is Marcel Kitton, because he didn't do any Grand Tour. And, and, and the way he did it, I think, was very stylish because, uh, well, I, I'm, I'm being serious there. I mean, the, uh, some other sprinters of his generation uh, did take part in Grand Tours. I'm thinking of Andre Greipel, who joined the uh, Arkea something tram to try and win sprints, which was not very uh, efficient. Uh, Marcel Kittel decided, you know, to, to retire in style. Uh, he said, you know, that's finished. Uh, I, I'm, 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 I'm through with cycling. I'm through with the business of cycling. I'm through with the, the kind of competition. I'm, I'm, I'm through with everything that's, that's uh, artificial about it. And, uh, uh, and, and this way, you know, he didn't have to face the infamy of, you know, finishing 19th in every sprint he, he, like Greipel or the even worse infamy of being, you know, Kicked out, well, not kicked out, but ruled out by his team uh, from the Tour de France. So I, I, I really found that moving uh, when when Kittel tweeted, you know, his, his retirement announcement, saying, "Right, guys, I mean, we, I, I had a great time. I did my, I did my time. Now I'm doing something else." Uh, and, and he was on the tour actually as a consultant on some of the tours as a consultant for for, for TVs. I, I think this guy's always been a stylish rider, a stylish guy, and, and the way he was not at the Grand Tours this year, I, I found very stylish as well. That was my, <laughs> that was my, my the, the, uh, so I, I start with the cat now, that, that, that's a little, that's a little cat. Uh, I mean, if you have kids, and, and or, or if you were a kid when he, he started, it's, it's a little blue Japanese manga cat called Doremon, and he, he, he was with us on the tour every day, so I, I call him Doremon Pulidor, of course. And, and Doram and Puridor, if you go to my Instagram uh, page, I mean, he followed the tour this year. He, he sat on uh, Garen Thomas' saddle. He sat in, on Thibaut Spino's seat in the FDJ bus. He had a great tour. So I, I, wanted to, <laughs> I, I really wanted an animal to be named. And, and, and finally, uh, well, I'd really like to, um, to name uh, Ola Shanoui. Because we, we all want cycling to become much more uh, of a mixed uh, sport and, and for women to get more involved. And maybe one of the solutions, I mean, I mean I've been thinking it over a lot, and we never know what to do if the, the girls should ride before the guys or after the guys or the day before or the day after. And maybe like in marathon, they should, they should ride uh, with the guys. And, and Ola managed to complete a treble. I mean, she did the three grand tours with a bunch of guys. And it, uh, I, I think there was probably a kind of a little bit of hostility in the, in the first, you know, when she started with, with these guys who were kind of, you know, hard-boiled uh, journalists or former writers. And in the end, she, you know, she, uh, she came out the winner, I think. Uh, in she wore them down. And so, so. <laughs> Where is she? So, as such, I think she really deserves. She really deserves an award. There uh, she is. <laughs> um, ah, you can. You can clap for her later. Okay, my sort of moment uh, of the year. My heroes, my Hall of Fame inductees, actually relates to this uh, this picture here, which is quite a strange cycling photograph of the year. Um, a man running <laughs> alongside some cars. Um, but it was that, that, this was an incredibly dramatic day. Um, stage 19 of the tour this year, uh, Saint-Jean-de-Maurienne to Tine, or that was the plan anyway. Um, 
I had a very strange day myself that day because we had a, I was, I was invited by Skoda, they sponsor the Cycling Podcast Feminine, which I do with Orla, and uh, they had a competition winner joining them in the VIP car that day and going up in a helicopter. And the deal was that I was to go along on this excursion too. And as we were driving to the start in the morning, um, Lionel and Francois in the car, Lionel said, said, you know, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go up in a helicopter. They're, they're very dangerous. <laughs> um, and I, I, said, uh, I said, there has never been a, an accident involving a helicopter at Tour de France. We'd know about it. And uh, Francois from the back said, uh, um, this means that the chances of one occurring increase every day. <laughs> And, uh, and Lionel, Lionel finished this with uh, some unconvincing sounding helicopter noises. <laughs> yeah, and, and that, that was every time the car went quiet, I heard that noise. And uh, anyway, the helicopter ride was the least dramatic part of the day, it turned out. I um, went ahead of the race. We were in one of the, the Skoda cars. We raced ahead, stopped about 40 kilometers into the stage where we met our helicopters. Even the fact that the pilot, as we clambered in, said, um, I've never flown in the mountains before. I, <laughs> I, 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 I usually fly tourists over Paris, she said. Even that didn't faze me because we'd been at the side of the road as the race went through and it was absolute chaos. And Thibaut Pino, who I'd just been saying was going to win the tour, was off the back. And I was kind of, I didn't know what was going on. I was trying to refresh my phone to find out what was happening. We go up in there. Um, we're 150 meters above the helicopters, which are directly above the race. So we couldn't really see what was happening. We could just see the riders spread out. And I knew there was real drama occurring and something had happened to Pino and I wasn't sure what. So we were up in the air, but I actually wished I was down on the ground. Um, we eventually did land at the bottom of the Col de Liseron. Um, at that point, we met our cars, which had raced ahead. We jumped into the cars and we drove up Liseron, down the other, a bit down the other side, stopped for a, a picnic, which was lovely. And um, as we got back into the cars after the picnic, we felt a dollop of rain, and it was one of those heavy dollops of rain. Uh, and, the, and the sky turned dark, and we, we took off in the cars, and the sky got darker and darker, and then this hail began falling, like heavy, you know, big balls of hail. And um, battering off the car, the noise, it was, it was, the noise was overwhelming, really. And then the road just turned to sheet ice, and we're driving along, and the race is only 25 minutes behind us. Bernal, we're watching on our screen. Bernal's attacked. He's away with Simon Yates. He's going over the, over the top of the Israel. Alaphilippe is starting to, to crack. And um, we're racing ahead on sheet ice. And, and most of the vehicles on the, on the tour had pulled into the side of the road. Um, we were able to carry on because we had a four-wheel drive car. And I was thinking, the, how are the riders going to be sent into this? This is, this is the recipe for absolute disaster. Then a few minutes, a little bit further on, um, we came up against this landslide. And the landslide really ruled definitively that the, the stage had to be cancelled. Um, and, it, you know, it was one of those days, that everything at the tour moves on so quickly. Like Lionel was saying about the day that Carapaz lost his time, you move on and the story the next day is something else. And even with this, I think you move on. And the next day, the story was, will the stage even happen? Will it be shortened? Will it be cancelled? And I don't think we ever really sort of properly digested what had happened on this day to teen, which the day that wasn't, you know, the stage that, that didn't finish. Um, my, two, uh, my two inductees are my driver that day in the Skoda, who was exceptional, as he always is. Um, and he's actually becoming a, a sports director for Barry Merida uh, next year. He's going to be driving one of these He's going to be driving year. that next year. Um, <laughs> Tim Harris. Tim, are you here? I want to get Tim up here on the stage. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to just stand like a statue. Sorry, Tim. <laughs> um, and, uh, and the other person I want to nominate also from that day, because one of the, the things, the, the, what, the, the, one of the people who had a real key job that day was the the man who does race radio, who communicates to all the teams uh, about what's happening in the race and to the press and so on. Um, and he was in the car with the, the race director and the chief commissar, and they were having to make decisions, obviously, about what was happening. And the instructions that were coming across the airwaves, and I think, again, this is something that the tour deserves a lot of credit for. What could have been a disaster actually wasn't, and, and it was very well organized. Decisions were, were made quickly, and they were communicated very, very clearly. 
And the man responsible for that really was the man who sits in the front seat, Seb Piquet. Come up, Seb. <laughs> and we have to finish at, at, at 7.05, and it's 7.05 now. We have to get Orla up as well, yeah, because Orla, Orla, you're like our, our, our inductee. <laughs> And uh, unfortunately, only one of these people can go into our Hall of Fame. <laughs> uh, so uh, we're going to have to do a clapometer, I think. Uh, oh, yeah, you could say gold, silver, and bronze, maybe. Um, so claps for Tim Harris, please. Yeah, quite, quite, quite loud, quite loud. Claps for Orla Shinoui. For what? For what? <laughs> and finally, Seb Piquet. Wow. Well, it, lo it looks like we have our, our gold medalist, Orla, and our joint silver medalist, Seb and Tim. Yeah, I'm afraid my nominee won easily. The <laughs> yeah, well done, Francois. Well done, you win. <laughs> Excellent. Well, we have to. I think we have to. We have to. We have to wrap. I think we could go on, couldn't we? Maybe we should go on until we're told to get off. Well, just 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 before we do go, we should we should explain that this uh, this is the cover of our new book, which is out next week. Oh, uh, nice that is one. Matt well White, done. who uh, sports director of Mitchell and Scott, of course, and who well he had to communicate to Simon Yates that the race was being mm. stopped, and uh, well we still haven't heard the full ins and outs of that story. If you want to hear that story, Matt will be joining us at the Arts Theatre in London's Leicester Square on November the 18th. 18th. Tickets, a few tickets still available if you want to come along to that. We're also doing an event a week later, November 25th, at the Arts Theatre as well with Adam Blythe and Chiro Scognomilio is joining us for that and Daniel Freib. So uh, two events in London coming up. Um, come along if you aren't already. And thank you very much for being a wonderful audience. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>